Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, <laughs> depending on where you might be. My name is Marcus Helberg. I'll be your host today in this Vaden webinar on Alacred Helpers. And with me, I have Anton. Hello, Anton. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing good. And, thanks. Good. And you are the you're the engineering manager for the Hilla team, if I recall correctly. Yes. Very recent change in job title, but still leading the the Hilla team essentially. Yes. That's the thing. Cool. Yes. All right. Well. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, I know a lot of people have been looking around at the the new CRUD helpers, and I thought it would be really cool to just have a quick live stream where you can show us a little bit about what they are and how they're kind of helpful in, in building CRUD apps. But I think before we get to actually how to use them, maybe you could explain to us a little bit about what you mean by CRUD views in general. Like what what are the what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? And uh, I'll share your screen here if you want to maybe give us some examples. Sure. So CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. So as, essentially, this, this is the application building pattern that uh, uh, say if you have a, a, a lot of database entries, uh, the application allows to browse through them to uh, have a little like through the list, select uh, some item, edit it, save it, or delete it, or create new items uh, in the same pattern. And uh, that's basically, this is very common for the business applications. Um, the, the data can be anything. It could be people, users, products, you name it. Yeah. So pretty pretty common pattern in, in business applications and applications in, in general, I'd say. Like yeah. I've, I've seen. I feel like I've seen tons of these uh, around in in all kinds of applications. Are they especially hard to build, or or why do we need helpers for building CRUDs? Yeah, there's nothing inherently hard with build, building it, but uh, uh, the the but the thing is that this pattern is really really common, and you would end up repeating yourself many times, probably even with this, in the scope of a single application, because you might have several CRUDs in one application very easily for editing various kinds of data. So yeah. it just gets repetitive and tedious to go through the same steps and uh, configuring lists, configuring the selection, editing, and whatnot. So yeah, it's more yeah, or less exactly. a time saver to, to, to help you not really like bring up the, the wheel every time. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. It's They're kind of different enough that you need some some changes to them, but also they're similar enough that you keep doing the same things over and over. And it's probably not the most kind of effective use of your time if you're building a large application that has a lot of these. So what kind of helpers does Hilla have for, for building these CRUD applications? Is it essentially what we're just looking at or what do we have to work with? Yes, yeah, so uh, to the, to, for the beginning, we have AutoCRUD. Um, this is basically a wrapper over the uh, old and familiar uh, grid component. So the, um, it allows to set up the grid really quickly with, with very little boilerplate. You give it the uh, generated things from the uh, Java structures. Mm -hmm. and it sets up the columns automatically, configures them with some reasonable defaults, like numbers to the right uh, and uh, things like nice. this, filtering and sorting enabled by default. OK, cool. Yeah. Then we also made AutoForm. This is new, and this is uh, this was just released in Hilo 2.4. Yeah. Um, what that is is uh, it's basically an automatically assembled form, uh, again, taking the data structure from Java and configuring the, like, listing the fields and with the submit button. Uh, allowing to create and edit uh, uh, an entry uh, mm -hmm. of the particular uh, database yeah. structure. And uh, to top it off, there is AutoCRUD that puts the form and the grid together. So um, basically wires one to the other and allows like to uh, select something in the grid and edit that and maybe delete this item or maybe save it back or maybe create a new one and also save it. 
Okay, so. cool. So yeah, I mean, that's pretty cool that not only do we have the the full type of CRUD functionality, but also the pieces that make up the CRUD functionality. So in some cases, maybe you only need like a grid with sorting and filtering and lazy loading and and that's all that you need for that particular thing. And sometimes maybe all you need is just the form, but now you have kind of the building blocks for 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 building that. Um, yeah. I forgot to mention when we got started, just a quick housekeeping uh, thing that if you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat next to us. And we actually already had a comment here saying that if something's very common and reasonably easy to do, it should be available in a standard library or framework. And that's exactly what we're essentially doing here. We're making it available in the Hello framework so that it is something that you can get done very easily and, and kind of uh, focus your, your programming efforts on other stuff. All right, well, I, I, I feel like I really want to see some code here. So maybe you could show me, you want to start with the grid, how I would create a grid if I wanted to use that in my application? Yeah. Um... Yeah, so let's let's get to that. But before that, maybe I have to add one more thing about the CRUD is that, uh, of course, this pattern of editing items is very common, but not all the applications look like this in the end. So you might might end up customizing your CRUD to the point that it doesn't look like a grid with a form anymore, and maybe it would end up in, in something else. So uh, they have like what the grid and the form and how to crowd give you is basically a starting point so mm -hmm. you would go from this and you would expand this change the looks of it and maybe at some point you would want to uh, replace it with a custom grid or maybe with not a grid but uh, the list of items and whatnot so yeah. this is essentially just the uh the build the initial building block from where you would go further so okay. with that in mind yes let's switch to the code then let's see so again when i'm there's a question here in in between as you're starting asking uh if this is also available in lit or is this uh specific to the react yeah uh, the version of Hilla? yes so the auto components are specific to react okay um yeah this is not available in, in lit and We'll see if we want to, to make it available in the future, but for now it's not in the roadmap. Yeah. It's good to hear from, from the community. So if that is yeah. something you wanna you wanna see, let us know. Definitely. All right. So you have a product I can see. Yeah, so I have a basic product uh, JPA entity defined in my Java code. So I guess many applications uh, that use SQL databases in Java would have this somewhere. So I just defined some fields here um, and uh, yeah, some getters and helpers, very standard stuff. Mm -hmm. And with this entity, I also have the repository that connects this to the database. Yep. And um, from this repository, what Hila uh, could, could, could give you is uh, the something called CRUD repository service. So the idea is that there's a base class that you can extend uh, and make browser callable. So here I have product service that extends the uh, Hila Scrub repository service. And it kind of puts all the methods there available in the browser to call. So it's... Do you want to quickly explain browser callable to to whoever's on the, on the stream who might not have seen or used Hila before? Just so yeah. they don't get confused. Yeah, so for those who have used Hila before, this is uh, uh, um, an alias to the endpoint annotation, Hila endpoints. Uh, basically, when building the project, Hila scans the Java uh, classes and finds all the browser callable annotated classes there. And it uses the structure, uh, the public methods from those classes to generate accessors in TypeScript. So, so essentially, it makes the, the Java service class callable from TypeScript. Yes, exactly. There is the generated TypeScript uh, class with the same name, with, with the same structure. 
uh, it's like in the generated code, it's not that pretty and it's all flattened out a bit, but basically there's account method, delete method, uh, exists, get, save, list, and uh, save all. So all the, all the methods from the, from public from this implementation. Nice. Have got, have got generated in TypeScript. So I can use them in TypeScript uh, uh, very naturally. For example, I can, if we now go to the TypeScript code, I have just an empty view here for now. Um, but let's say if I want to uh, load um, uh, uh, an entity here uh, with a particular ID, I can call uh, product service get and it's an asynchronous method, so I shouldn't probably call it uh, <laughs> from the top level of my React function yeah. anyway. So let me add a, a effect. So let's say I have just a callback that runs once one, uh, for the first time when this view gets displayed and it runs some initialization code and it loads the entity with the ID, let's say one from the database. Yeah. And then I can, I have a callback with this product, so I can use it somehow. One typical yeah. use would be if I have the state. Um, let's say use state. And of course, initially, I don't have the data, so my my product will be undefined, but eventually it will be the type of product. Yeah. Um, this is That's another good. side benefit of using browser callable is that, let's get back to this product service. So this product entity, the same structure will be generated in TypeScript. So you, you can skip. We can save a lot of time on defining the same fields in TypeScript called replicating the structure of your Java class here. Nice. Now, um, let, let's see the, the spring classes, but do I have, yeah, I have the product here. So I automatically have the structure in TypeScript with name, category, price, and the same fields from the entity. Nice. So it's really and easy, I can... can say that yeah, I have the type product in my in my TypeScript code. Yeah. Me, and essentially it. what the what the auto grid and form and crud do is that you don't actually have to do all of this state management and effects and stuff yourself, even necessarily for for some of these crud operations they're taken care of by the framework. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Let's see if I just write product name. I actually have it. Oh, of course, I don't have the product initially. Yes. <laughs> Apple. <laughs> nice. Okay. So yeah. the next step then would be to use the is it the auto grid that we're using for for listing things? Yes, of course I could have uh, as well, instead of selecting one particular entity, I can get all of them. Um, so there's the list method that I could use. Yeah. It's, it's like the API is a bit technical there because I need to kind of specify the page and the filter and whatnot if I would want to use it directly. But luckily I don't have to. And I could instead skip all this hassle and just put auto grid here. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, yeah, I have some help from TypeScript here. It, it kind of specifies this uh, mandatory properties for me and invites me to fill them up. I know that I want to use product service and I want to use uh product as my model here so the model 
property describes the data type, but I have to use this product. Instead of product, I have to use product model here because that's the, uh, essentially a copy that retains this information in runtime and, and doesn't erase this uh, so that I can, like the JavaScript runtime in the browser can could list the fields and uh, uh, take the information about the data type. Uh, Got it. Use, use this to, to set up the grid. So product model. And it should be enough once I have the imports defined. Yes, I have the import suggested. Save. The browser is automatically reloading. Bam, and I have the grid with all the data. Nice. And like sorting and filtering works out of the box? Correct. So by default, I have the sorting by the first column uh, automatically kind of done. I can click around and change the sorting. Okay. I can filter by uh, some content inside this column. So let's say if I, if I want all the berries, I can just type berry here. Mm -hmm. And there's also filtering based on the greater than less than or equals for the numbers. So let's say I want all the expensive product products more than five. Okay, nice. Yeah. And I, I saw the when you when you call the list service manually, there was this pageable. Does that mean that as you're kind of if you have a really long list of things here in the browser, if you're kind of scrolling down, it's actually taking care of the paging? of the data for you? Is that what's happening? Yes, exactly. That's the feature of the grid. So it, it's, uh, it has so-called lazy loading. So it will actually only request the pages that have something uh, to show, like that would be visible on the screen. So nice. while user is scrolling, I don't have much data here, but if there is like uh, thousands or millions of records, yeah. As the user scrolls them, the additional pages would be requested. Yeah. And is it like how customizable is this? Like, can I change the order of columns or which columns are shown, or maybe like what, how a specific column gets rendered? Is that something I could do? Yeah, those are, uh, yeah, these are possible. So let's see. Uh, for the basics, if you just want to change which columns are visible. We can set uh, visible columns, and this this allows to let's say I just want one column. I specify visible columns, and it would it should remove all the all the other columns in the from the grid. I made a typo, did I? Yes, visible. Now I only have one main column, but you mm -hmm. can also use this to specify the order. So let's say okay. I would want price before my name, I can use this. The auto sizing gets confused when automatically reloading this view, but in the real application, if, if I would load okay. it from I scratch. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, but if I want to specify uh, some, uh, let's say some particular representation of, of some item. Uh, I would have to define the renderer uh, for it. Uh, okay. What what this means is that I, I can basically define a React component that would be responsible of showing something for the particular row. Um, for example, let me put all the columns back here. And uh, let's say I, I want to display those names in the bold because those are product titles. Yeah. Mm. I, run, I would need a function. Uh, let's say the title name. And uh, it can be called, uh, the name doesn't really matter. But it will actually receive the item 
uh, in the properties and the type of this item corresponds to the type of our model. So in this case, it's product. I would need to import this now. The first suggestion is somehow wrong. It's not the license. Let's see all imports. This one is the correct product. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I can render them if I want. Let's say using the B tag. And from this item, I want to render the name field here. I can also go for combinations of name and uh, other fields and whatnot and use the computed formulas here or something like this. Yeah. Um, yes. So once I have this renderer that uh, shows something, I can use it with the grid uh, this way. Uh, here there's the column options property. And inside, I have to specify the object in which the keys uh, correspond to the properties of, of the model. So let's say okay. for, the, for the name property, I have some additional options here. And uh, in, 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 this, in this name column, I want to replace the renderer. So renderer, let me just use my theme. Name renderer here. Yeah. I'm missing the traveler base. Yeah, yes. No typos. I set the file and they immediately became both. Okay. Nice. So essentially, since I have access to the whole item there, I could create like a Pretty much any anything based on on that. Does that mean I could kind of add a a column that's kind of computed from other values as well using the same pattern? So if yeah, I... absolutely, you can use as many values as you want here, and you can okay. say put the ID in here. Or let or let me put the ID in this one maybe. Yeah, you can even put other React components and uh, wilding components here as well. Nice. OK, um, I'm going to be mindful of the time, so let's keep moving forward. So if we now have we have this product, what if we wanted to create a form for this product instead of this grid? How would we go about doing that? Yeah, let's try to do this. So um, should I? Have the format in the same file, or should we actually create another view? Uh, I think you can just go in the same file. Like right. that way, we don't have to switch context mentally, and we already have some of the imports there. And okay, but I'll remove the grid for now. Um, let's try to use auto form. Auto form, and again, I need to specify the service and the model. So same stuff. Product service. Product service and product model. Yep. And let's see what it does. Looks very looks very similar to what we had initially. <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah. It does something, it shows all the fields, but they are initially empty because I didn't specify like which item exactly I'm editing. So by default it's it's a form that creates new items, I suppose. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, we already looked earlier at like how we could use the endpoint to get a specific ID. So we could, I guess, if we have that, we could then pass it into the auto form. Yeah, exactly. There's this item property, and we can use this to pass the. Yeah, it suggests that I, that I should pass the product from the outer context. Yeah. So, yes, exactly. You would you would probably have your own state here and load the item and then pass it to the form. Yeah, essentially what you did in the beginning. Yes. Yeah. How customizable is the form? I know people like to build complex forms and maybe have like specific layouts for them and everything. Is that all something that we can kind of customize when using auto form? 
or is it pretty much the layout that we see here? Uh, you can customize the layout, but however, if you would look into that, that would be basically uh, like, it would mean that you will build basically the form inside of the form yourself, because inside your custom layout, you would need to specify like how you render in each single field. Okay. So um, I can show the example from the documentation, basically customizing the form layout. So okay. one simple option is just to configure the uh, options for the form layout, for the form layout component that the auto form uses inside. This is pretty easy. There's the properties exposed. Uh, but if you would want to go more, like uh, uh, to explore deeper customization options, so you yeah. would essentially build your own form and you can have your own layouts here. Okay. There are some fields that auto form passes for you. You can use those. There's, here's the example of how to do that. Uh, but you can also replace the fields with, with your own custom fields once you, like this way. Okay. When you when you build a custom form layout, nice. uh, essentially it's kind of the same thing. Okay. How does the? Uh... However, uh, just one small note, but you know, lay layout is basically like the the more complex customization here. The simple things are actually simpler to do. So if you would want just to replace the label and provide some. Mm -hmm. uh, like simple options like this, you can you can just use the field options with the same structure as the column options in the auto group. You pass the okay. you, you provide the uh, field name and then you, you have the objects with options that pass to this particular field. Yeah. How does uh, validation work here? I know forms tend to have a lot of validation rules. How do you define those in in this case? Uh, well, first thing first, you can define your validation in Java, and that's what you should probably consider. Uh, like uh, above all, is that uh, your server validates uh, mm -hmm. the data to make sure the consistency on the on the backup side. So, yeah. uh, for example, something that Hila supports uh, is the JPA, uh, not JPA, JSR free annotations here you can use those uh, something like not blank yeah. or pattern. say like the pri price needs to be more than zero <laughs> or something like that maybe yeah so is it positive yes and you use this in java and that will enable backend validation for you. And uh, Hila will also propagate this to the client side and do the same validation on the client side uh, to save on the round trips. OK, so if you now go into the field or the form that you have there and try to put like a negative value, that's not going to work. Yeah, I didn't reload that. But I, I, once I change the job, I think I need to do the same. Just to... Yeah, yeah. Let's see. There's a new build, then the server should restart. So it's going to take a few seconds, but after that. Yeah, that's a really kind of weird feature in IntelliJ where you have to build it yourself. Whereas, like, if you're using VS Code or Eclipse, it essentially just does it. I don't know why they why they decided to go this route. It seems like it's restarted now. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe let's see. OK. Yes. Oh, it did another reload for me for some reason. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, oh, it's, okay. it's not like it's not live coding if it works. <laughs> <laughs> no, it actually works, but I have an extra restart for some reason. It, it's uh, if you uh, maybe this is a good tip for anyone using Hilla. So if you go into your IntelliJ settings there, uh, yeah. if you're well, actually, no. Since you're not running, uh, you're not running it through IntelliJ. That's not going to be the case. But it's there's a yeah. there's a feature in IntelliJ if you run it through IntelliJ where it does a double reload unless you turn off a thing there. But all right, yeah. so let's uh, keep going. So we have 
we've checked kind of how we can validate things that seems good we can customize the fields so i i guess really now we're to a point where we know how to build a list of things we know how to build a form and now we want to see like how do we combine these into a full-blown crud like how do we how do we do that is it going to be just changing the auto form part there to auto crud is it going to be that easy let's try no probably not the one yes i need probably to need to import it too yes once i update the import yep it will load after the error yes here we go that's the fully functional crowd view nice right away i can i can still sort the grid yes i can click on the items and i get the selected item in the form Let's see if I can change the title to something funny. Yes. <laughs> that and works. If you refresh now, that's still let's persist that that's in the database. Yes. Nice. Yes. So and yeah. can can I still like customize all the same things for the grid and the form that I was able to do before? So if I wanted to have those same bold names with the name render i could still do that yeah but there's just one uh additional layer you can still access the grid options but we, you have to use grid props here and then you have your column options then you can have name and uh your Okay. Yeah, that should work. Yeah, it worked. Makes sense. Okay, so um, I'm still like the same level of kind of customization for each, but just yes. in one. Of course, similar with that, we have form options and we can form props. Sorry, form yeah. props. And we can pass. So you could change like the label of a field through there. Yes. Okay. Makes sense. Is there a way to change the layout of the CRUD itself? Like maybe I want to have the form on the bottom instead of on the side. Is that something oh. I can do? Well, I'm not sure. Let's take a look in the documentation. Maybe. I guess. I guess not. Okay, we don't so have examples. Still, still on the to-do list. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess this is going to be one of those things where like we got the first version out and now when we start seeing what people try to do with it we can get a lot of good ideas on things that we want to make more customizable yeah of course and uh, uh well yeah but uh one thing to note is that if, if i'm using this on mobile device then i don't need to customize it it's going yeah. to um yes it's going to work like yeah. this so. How do I get out of this editor, though? I, uh, I guess we just save the item. <laughs> so I can't I cancel out of it? Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, it's always good to do a little product testing while we're doing a webinar, just in case. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Seems like it's missing a button. <laughs> like I, I would expect there to be a to be a button that I can use to get out of it. Yeah, Are you using escape? Yeah, I'm using escape here. <laughs> we oh I I see we got a we got the answer here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Use using Vim commands, apparently. Um one thing if we kind of go back more to the beginning of the the code where you showed how you set this up. You're using the CRUD repository service, was it? Yeah. And so that maps it directly to the JPA repository. What, what if I'm not using JPA or I'm using DTOs? Is that something that supported at all? Or what happens if I need to kind of customize things on, yeah. on that level? Yeah, there, there's a a few known uh, missing features uh, in, in this regard. 
you would probably have something working, but you would not be able to use the cloud repository service based on the JPA here, but you would need to implement uh, the, this interface. Uh, okay, so if I, as long as I can implement, kind of point those methods to whatever my backend is, it should still work. Yes, with one, uh, again, another known exception is that the uh, uh, sorting and filtering would be probably hard to implement on the backend side this way. This, this is something that's very easy with the JPA, but with your, uh, uh, with a custom implementation, implementing a flexible sorting and filtering is known to be tedious. Yeah. So one option would be there to just replace all the columns with, uh, with uh, custom columns that don't provide this sorting and filtering of function. Okay. That, that could be a workaround. Yes. But, but something we this might is something look into on our, making yeah, easier. Actually, this is something that we are improving right now and uh, we'll probably ship some. Uh, in the upcoming Hila 2.5 release that's going to be out by the end of this year, uh, we're going to ship to some improvements for using the DTO. So, yeah. Enabling, yeah, basically enabling some easier options to, for customization for those things that uh, are not that easily available right away when you don't have the access to the entity. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there anything else that's kind of that you're working on in terms of new features for these, or are you now kind of waiting for user feedback, or what's the kind of next step for, for these CRUD helpers in, in Hilla? Yeah, we are largely waiting for the user feedback because it's like at this point, it's really hard to decide like what is, what is more important and what is less important. So, but yeah, yeah. we know about this DTO use case. This is something that uh, we are improving. And uh, there's a bunch of smaller enhancements here and there. Uh, things like easier access to nested fields, uh, uh, and uh, uh, things like this. So when you're composing your DTO, let's say, from several classes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, things like this. Very cool. All right. We have a few questions, but before we get there, is there kind of anything still you want to show? Any like cool features that I forgot to <laughs> ask about that you want to still show? Yeah, I think not. It's yeah, that's the, basically the gist of it. Like, it's this easy to get a fully functional CRUD view. Yeah, so it's essentially auto grid form or CRUD, and then both taken or all of them taken the same service and and model. Yeah. And if you're happy with the defaults, you have pretty much all your CRUD for, uh, CRUD views sorted out with with just that. That's pretty cool. It's I, I can see that being very helpful in, in a lot of kind of back office applications that are basically just tens and tens of of uh, CRUD views stacked on top of each other. All right. Um, and again, reminder to everyone: if you want to ask any questions, you can use the chat feature there. We have a couple of more meta questions here about Hilla. So, first one is kind of in general, like what is the advantages or disadvantages of Hilla over Baden Flow? And the other one was from Fred asking him being a experienced Java developer, are there any benefits to migrating to Hilla? So yeah. maybe you can talk a little bit about what, what is the difference between Hilla and, and Vaden Flow and when might you want to use one or the other? Yeah, so ultimately the biggest difference is where and how exactly the UI logic is defined. So with Flow, you have the UI tree completely on the server side in Java, uh, whereas with Hila, you have the UI on the client side. In this, in this case, with React. So if you if you have the team that have uh, some that that would benefit from having React on the on the front end side, uh, let's say. This, from resourcing perspective or uh, because it's easier uh, for some people to learn React or because it's, it's much more productive in a way that 
uh, you would get changes displayed in a matter of uh, like uh, uh, split second in your browser when you're developing your application. Yeah. So if I type something here, I save the file, I have something appearing in the background right away. Yeah. So that's why, or if you have, let's say, a, an application where you want offline capabilities to work, uh, if you want yeah. something functional on the, in the browser, even without the network connection. So this, the, those are all good reasons to put the UI logic on the client side. And then you would be probably looking into uh, using modern client side frameworks like React. And then Hilo would be naturally a good option for you. Yeah. I, I would say in like cases that I've seen it, very often it boils down to something kind of even less technical than that. It's just like a preference, like what does the team or developer like to use? So in Fred's case, if he's a experienced Java developer and enjoys working in Java primarily, then Flow is probably a really good framework for that. And if you're somebody who enjoys working more closer to the browser using front end technologies, uh, using TypeScript and, and HTML directly, then Hill is probably a, a good fit for that. So in, in most cases, like expect, uh, expect, okay, sorry, still six o'clock in the morning. So I see, <laughs> I seem to have problems speaking still. Uh, in most cases, except for things like offline uh, use cases, like you mentioned, you can pretty much build the exact same application using Vodenflow or Hilla, like the component set is exactly the same and everything. So you could build a visually similar application with either just based on your preference. All right. Um, good. We have a question here about summary in grids. So I'm not entirely sure what uh syndrome means here but it probably might be like a footer showing like oh. the total or something if you're still there syndrome maybe you can add some more information if that's what you're meaning like maybe a, a footer row or something like that is that something that we support yeah but that that would probably require some customization um let's see i i would have to dive into the grid documentation here because uh, essentially that's the grid feature that allows to specify the footer um so uh, let's see if there are some examples for column grouping uh column alignment column freezing column grouping okay so uh, first of all the columns in the grid is something you can have in a tree-like structure. So you can group them like so yeah. and define is... a common property. In this case, it's the header common for those sub kind of items. For those columns, there's a common header name. And yeah. equally, you can define a common footer for multiple columns and uh, for the entire grid exactly the yeah. same. And there you so can put actually... a custom renderer with your summary or yeah. So like essentially, that. you should be able to use the grid footer footer there yes as long as you yeah here we have okay. example of the footers but in this case those are defined on the column level however you can also put them on the group level like so okay so yeah again and define a define a render and... yeah and specifically about the summary with the total number of items this is something in the uh, in the auto crud backlog and that's, that's something that i think the team is working on right now so we're going to yeah. have a dedicated feature for this use case. Yeah, good. Seem like we got a follow-up question on our previous discussion here about Flow and Hilla. So Victor is asking for some uh, more clarification. So Flow is using a session to store all the component states, and Hilla is fully stateless. Is that correct statement? Uh, more or less correct. Like, um, depending on the your authentication configuration, it might not actually be fully stateful because in some particular use cases, you would actually want the authentication state to be stored on the backend using the session still. For example, when you integrate with the, uh, the third party uh, authentication provider like SSO or something like that, um, it's much easier to implement if you store the uh, 
the token, the authentication token from the third party provider in the server session. So that's the safest yeah. and easiest option. So yeah, in this case, essentially, like there will be still a small part of state, but not like this big as with flow that puts all, all the UI yeah. there. But, but, but essentially, that's still that means that it's not Hilla is not putting anything in the session. In that case, it's like Spring Security that's using the session. So Hilla itself doesn't necessarily require a a server state. Yeah, that this this is correct. Yeah. Yeah. All right, very good. We got a final question here also about choosing between Bond and Hilla, but I, I feel like we pretty much answered that already. So if you just joined the stream, <laughs> scroll back maybe five minutes here and, and uh, check out the discussion that we had just a, a few minutes ago. All right, Anton, I think we're out of questions. We've seen all the good stuff that you showed here. How can people try these out on their own? Can you kind of point them in the right direction before we uh, wrap up here? Yeah, so you, you can just go to hila.dev, uh, take a look at this quick start tutorial, uh, grab one of the uh, starting projects this way, or, or maybe use the CLI to, to generate those, and then you can just follow up with the tutorials. Yep. And there's the auto grid, and all, all the auto components are conveniently at the top of the components list in this section. So just continue yep. there. All right. Thanks. Perfect. Uh, yeah, thanks, Anton. Uh, good to have you here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, if you have any questions following up on this, just feel free to use the, the comments on the video, and we'll keep an eye on those. And And you can. Find us, of course, on on GitHub and and Discord. So feel free to join us there and and let us know what you think when you try them out. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye.